Let's talk about hydrogen bonding. That's another type of intermolecular force. That's a really special case of dipole-dipole forces. If you look at these two graphs, see if you can figure out what this actually is a graph of. You can see that it's molecular mass on the bottom, but it's uh, temperature on the y-axis. Look at the red compounds and see if you can see where those are on your periodic table. So if you look, you may have guessed that this is a graph of boiling point. We know that water boils at 100 C. And these elements, oxygen, sulfur, selenium, and tellurium, are all in one column on the periodic table. And you can also see in this blue graph that carbon, silicon, germanium, and tin are also in another group or column in the periodic table. And we notice that water is kind of off track. The other ones, as you get that increasing mass, you get increased boiling point. But water is way higher than any of the others. So it's special because it has what's called hydrogen bonding. And that's a special case of dipole-dipole intermolecular forces. Everything that has hydrogen bonding has dipole-dipole forces. What happens is the difference in the electronegativity between certain atoms and hydrogen is so strong, it creates a really strong dipole. And so there are only certain elements that can do this. So think about which elements have the strongest electronegativity. Think about that periodic trend. Hopefully you're thinking, okay, the ones in the upper right. So when you think about that, it's there are three atoms that can bond with hydrogen to give us hydrogen bonds. So anything with a nitrogen-hydrogen bond, an oxygen-hydrogen bond, or a fluorine-hydrogen bond will have hydrogen bonding intermolecular forces. It has to be a bond between the nitrogen and the hydrogen, oxygen and hydrogen, and fluorine and hydrogen. Not just have those two elements in the same compound, but they have to be bonded to each other. All right? Let's talk about why we care about hydrogen bonding. It's super important. It's the reason that ice floats. If you look, these are two water molecules here. And what happens is when water molecules settle, they set themselves up in a situation where they form this hexagonal shape because the distance between the negative oxygen in one and the partially positive hydrogen in another, there's that attraction. And so they set themselves up in this hexagonal shape. So when you see snowflakes, they always have six little crystal arms sticking off of them. That's that hexagonal shape. We talked about the fact that regular shapes on an atomic level are seen as regular shapes in on the uh, visible level. And that's the reason that ice floats. Most compounds uh, in their solid form do not float in their liquids. Uh, ice is unique that way. The other thing that's super important to us, you probably are recognizing that this is DNA, um, hydrogen bonding is what allows that double helix to form. When you looked at this in biology, you learned that thymine and adenine always uh, match up and cytosine and guanine always match up. The reason for that is thymine and adenine have two sites for hydrogen bonds to form. Cytosine and guanine have three, and that's why they match up in their base pairs that way. The last type of uh, intermolecular forces we need to talk about are London dispersion forces, or LDFs. And they're called induced dipoles. If you've heard the word induced used before, you may have heard it when talking, somebody's talking about uh, going, being put into labor. A woman who's pregnant has her labor induced, so they give her medicine to force her to go into labor. Um, but this is what happens when the electrons in one molecule force a dipole to occur in another molecule. So if you have two helium atoms that are next to each other, the nucleus of this atom on the left is attracting those electrons from the atom on the right. And when that happens, both electrons end up on the same side of the atom, and it causes that induced dipole, like this partial negative charge forming, which causes on the other end a partial positive charge. They only last for a moment. They're very brief. And so they just have those momentary imbalances. And the more electrons an atom has, the stronger the LDFs. 
any molecule can have LDFs. So when I ask you if a, a molecule has LDFs, your answer should always be yes. All right, so let's look at what that has to do with that graph that we looked at a little bit earlier. We talked about the fact that water has hydrogen bonding that makes it have that really high melting point. But if you look at these others, you can see that as you go down a column, so sulfur to selenium to tellurium, the boiling point goes up. And what's happening is those atoms, sulfur uh, has fewer atoms than selenium, or sorry, when you look at these, uh, tellurium has more electrons than selenium. Selenium has more electrons than sulfur. Same thing on this group. So as you go down the periodic table uh, in a column, the, the elements are going to have more a higher boiling point because they have more electrons. So in this case, hydrogen telluride would have stronger LDFs than hydrogen selenide or hydrogen sulfide because it has more electrons. Therefore, it has a higher boiling point. Let's talk about why we care about LDFs. We all like to go places. So crude oil, this is just for your information. You don't need to, to write this down, but we use uh, refined oil for gas. And so what happens is, So why do we care about crude oil? Well, we all like to go places. So with crude oil, it's refined based on the differences in the LDFs. So crude oil contains carbon uh, molecules with carbon chains that are really short, like one to four carbon atoms with hydrogen on them. But it also contains very high, long uh, carbon chains with 70 or more carbon atoms with hydrogens bonded to them. So what happens is they put crude oil into what's called a cracking column or a fractionating column, and they heat it. And as they heat it, you can see that there are these little plates in here. And so if it stays liquid, it doesn't go through the plates. If it becomes a vapor, if it boils, it goes up and through these little openings and goes up higher in the column. And so they take all of the remaining liquid off so something that has a really long carbon chain of 70 or more, they pull off the bottom of that column, and that's used for things like paving roads. And then as the chains get shorter, there are fewer and fewer electrons, fewer LDFs, and so they go higher up the column, and they get pulled off depending on their boiling point. So you get things like diesel fuel. Uh, as you go further up and the carbon chains get even shorter, you get gas, and uh, even shorter you get uh, liquefied petroleum gas, those sorts of things that we use around the house. So longer carbon chains have higher boiling points because they have more electrons, and so they have more uh, higher boiling points. Longer carbon chains have higher boiling points because they have more electrons, more carbons, more hydrogens, more electrons, stronger LDFs. So let's compare these. LDFs are the weakest. Everything has LDFs. Dipole-dipole are in the middle in terms of their strength. They are the ones that either are bent, trigonal pyramidal, or have different atoms around the outside. And then the strongest is the hydrogen bonding. And hydrogen bonding are atoms that have hydrogen bonded to fluorine, hydrogen bonded to oxygen, and hydrogen bonded to nitrogen. So we're going to look at how to compare that, uh, the three of these, and figure out which intermolecular forces that different molecules have.